بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم مائی ڈیئر اسٹوڈنٹ ویلکم ٹو دا کورس آف انٹروڈکشن ٹو کمپیوٹنگ آئی ہوپ مائی لیکچرز آر بینگ کلیئر ٹو یو اینڈ یو آر ناٹ فال فائنڈنگ اینی پرابلم ان لرننگ دی کانسیپٹس اینڈ انڈرسٹینڈنگ دی کانٹینٹس ان مائی لاسٹ لیکچر آئی ہیو انکریج یو پیپل ٹو وزٹ the websites recommended by me although mostly I am using Wikipedia as the medium but there are many other sites from where you can get much more useful information now let's start the today's lecture today's lecture is number five as our practice goes on first of all we will discuss the summary of the last lecture in our last lecture we have looked with the different input devices in our last lecture we mostly focused on two basic and standard input devices that is the keyboard and the mouse a standard keyboard has about 100 to 105 keys then there are different layouts the standard keyboard has about 100 keys and it is normally called IBM compatible keyboard or the other. Now there are five groups of keys that we have discussed in our last lecture. The first group was the alpha numeric keys. They are used for producing numbers and letters. Then we discuss the numeric keypad which is located on the right hand side of the keyboard and basically that is used for quick number entry and there are some mathematical operators are also given on the numerical keypad such as addition, subtraction, multiplication and division. The third set are the function keys which are labeled F1, F2, F3 and so on up till F12. They are located at the top of the keyboard. And this basically they are used for input commands without typing long sentences of characters and they are also used in navigating the menus or the dialog boxes provided by different softwares. The fourth group was the modifier keys such as control, alt, shift. Basically these keys modifies the input of the other keys and they are always used in conjunction with other keys. The fifth group was the cursor movement keys which lets you move around the screen without using a mouse. <coughs> we also discuss some special purpose keys such as escape, print screen, pause and scroll lock. They perform unique functions. For example, the print screen key available in some applications creates an image of whatever is visible on the monitor. Then we also discuss the internet and multimedia controls provided by some of the keyboards. When you press a key, the keyboard controller places a code in the keyboard buffer. And it indicates that which key was pressed. The code was stored in the buffer and the controller sends an interrupt to the operating system which is a system software. And the system software detects the, uh, reads the code from the keyboard buffer and passes it on to the CPU for further processing. Then we also discussed some other uh, keyboard styles such as Warwick and other non-standard keyboard layouts. For the Warwick keyboards, the uses, it uses less finger motion and it the typing rate has been increased 
and it pr produced less errors as compared to the standard QWERTY keyboard. But QWERTY keyboard are still the most popular layout. In the case of the non-standard keyboard layouts, we discussed the corded keyboard with the handlebar strings pronouns. We discussed the software or the virtual keyboard, which is nowadays the best example the Google is implemented in Urdu. And for the Urdu input, the virtual or the software keyboard is displayed by clicking the icon. Then we discuss about the foldable keyboards. We also discuss about the projection keyboard with the laser technology. We also discuss about the optical keyboards and the wireless keyboard. The other standard input device is the mouse. In our last lecture, we discussed that mouse is a pointing device that lets you control the position of a graphical pointer on the screen without using the keyboard. We discuss two different types of mouse. One is the mechanical mouse and the other is the optical mouse. The mechanical mouse uses a ball and the ball is moved around with the hand on the table and the movement of the ball sends signals to the computer and the computer understands the situation with the context and pass it on to the display. In the optical, the LED and prism is used to detect the motion of the uh, mouse and then it sends signals. Then we discuss the interaction with the mouse and we discuss in detail the five techniques, the pointing, the clicking, the double clicking, dragging, and right clicking. We also discuss some variations of the mouse, such as the trackball, trackpad, and track point. A trackball is like a mouse turned upside down. The ball comes up and the buttons are around it. The ball is placed and with the thumb or with the finger the ball is moved around so that the cursor can be moved and the selection is made using the buttons. It provides the functionality of a mouse but takes less space on the desktop. A trackpad is a touch sensitive pad that provides the same functionality as a mouse. To use a trackpad you glide the your finger across the pad, its surface, and then the two buttons just below it you for selection. There are some sensitive touch pads where you can, with the help of the tapping of your fingers, you can do the input. Many notebook computers provide a joystick-like pointing device built into the keyboard, which is called a track point. You control the pointer by moving the joystick. This is most commonly available on IBM ThinkPad machines. Generically, it is called an integrated pointing device. I hope I have revised the last lecture and the concepts have been clear to you. If you still find any problem, you can always contact me through email. Now let's start the today's lecture. Today we will discuss about ergonomics and input devices. Ergonomics is the study of the physical relationship between people and their tools, such as the people, and addresses these issues. Any office worker will tell you that working at a desk all day can be extremely uncomfortable. Sitting all day and using a computer can be even worse. Not only does the user's body ache from being in the chair too long, but hand and wrist injuries can result from using a keyboard and a mouse for longer periods of time. 
Eyes can become strained from strain staring at a monitor for hours. Such injuries can be extremely can be extreme and threatening the user's general health and its his ability to work. So ergonomics is the study of human and the tool interaction. It is concerned with the physical interaction and it attempts to improve safety and comfort. Now more than ever before people have started recognize the importance of having ergonomically correct computer furniture and using proper posture and techniques while working with the computers. The term ergonomically correct means that a tool or a workplace is designed to work properly with the human body and thus it reduces the risk of strain and injuries. The field of ergonomics did not receive much attention until a certain class of injuries began appearing among clerical workers who spend most of their time entering data on the computer keyboards. These ailments are called repetitive strain injury, abbreviated as RSI. As the name suggests, this injury comes from the repetitive strain. The strain is keep on repeating and at, at a certain point of time when it reaches its limit, it's turned into an injury. The RSI or the repetitive strain injury is an injury of the musc musculoskeletal and nervous system and that may be caused by repetitive tasks, forceful exertions, vibrations, mechanical compression means pressing against the hard surfaces, sustained or awkward positions. It is caused by continuous misuse of the body in ways it was not designed to work. Typically we in our daily life we are not using our body as it was designed to do so. When we are young we used to do things very forcefully without taking care of the body. But after entering the age of 30 and then in the 40s, your body was not as strong as it can. And that at that time, the knee injuries, the other ailments, they start propping up. So it is high time that we must consider our health as the top priority. Let me give you some examples of how we can misuse our body. Reading or doing tasks for extended period of times while looking down can cause injuries later on. Sleeping on an inadequate bed or a mattress or sitting in a bad armchair in an uncomfortable position will ultimately hurt your muscles and the body. Carrying heavy items without taking proper care of your body, holding one's phone between neck and shoulder, watching TV in incorrect position, for example, too much to the left or too much to the right, sleeping with head forward while traveling, prolonged use of the hands, wrists, back, neck, etc. and sitting in the same position for a long period of time. Many professionals suffer from RSI. Let's talk about the carpal tunnel syndrome. The carpal tunnel is a passageway in the wrist through which nerves passes. And it holds the nerves and tendons. In the carpal tunnel syndrome, tendons in the tunnel they become inflamed because the victim has held his or her wrists stiffly for long periods as people tend to do at a keyboard. So we can say that prolonged keyboarding will swell the tendon. 
When the tendon becomes inflamed, they press against the nerves, causing tingling, numbness, pain, or the inability to use your hands. Carpal tunnel syndrome is a condition resulting from compression at the wrist of the median nerve which runs from the forearm into the hand and is responsible for sensation and certain aspects of movement in the thumb and the first three fingers. Hairstylists they often suffer from the carpal tunnel. Bicyclists they can suffer from overuse injuries of the knee. We always see nowadays that in cricket and in hockey and in football due to the excessive use of the body the life of the professional cricketers and footballers have been reduced. After 30, they start getting more injuries in the short time because they are overusing their body. Victims can miss weeks or months of work due to these kind of injuries. And in extreme cases, surgery may be required to get the things done. Let's see the figure. This is the palm of the hand and this one are the median nerves and this one is the traverse, transverse carpal ligament and these are basically the muscles which are around it. And then these blue things, these are the finger flexor tendons. On the left side, you will see the cross section of the wrist. These things, they are the carpal bones and these are the tendons covering around it and these are the small blood vessels and these are the carpal tunnels and between this this is the median nerve which when it's inflamed is pressed and then it causes numbness and all and this figure is taken from the website from the kidsbritannica.com the address is given here Please read this article for more details about the carpal tunnel syndrome. Now how we can avoid the repetitive strain injuries or we can say the keyboard related injuries we are, because in the computing environment we are more concerned with the keyboard and the other input devices and the output devices. If you use a computer frequently you can avoid repetitive strain stress injuries by adopting a few good work habits and by making sure that your hardware and workplace are set up in an ergonomically friendly way. When setting up your computing workspace, make it a priority to choose a comfortable and ergonomically correct designed chair. So choose comfortable office furniture. Your office chair should allow you to adjust its height, provides good lower back support, and it must have adjustable armrests. The desk should hold your keyboard and mouse at the proper height so that your hands are at the same height as your elbows or a few inches lower when you hold them over the keyboard. Your keyboard must have a keyboard tray. You, you keep your hands at keyboard height and place the monitor at the eye level. Let's give you the example how to sit at a computer. Closely see this diagram. Your height Adjust the seat height so that upper arms hang vertically, elbows bent at 90 degree. You see, this is the 90 degree. Adjust backrest to support this small back of the back. Use a footrest if it is necessary. You hold the wrist in a neutral position, not bent upwards or downwards. It should be straight. You should position your monitor 10 to 12 inches away from your eyes. 
and adjust the monitor so the top of the screen is 5 to 15 degree below the horizontal line of sight. It is good to use a document holder next to the screen rather than laying papers flat on the table because then you have to keep on looking on the papers all the time and it will create problems. The viewing distance should be 10 to 24 inch. The viewing angle is between 5 to 15 degrees. The wrist should be straight. Remember, your arms and elbows, it must hold a 90 degree angle. Lumbar support for the lower back, seat back angle is 90 degree. Your knee angle should be 90 degree straight. And this height must be 23 to 28 inches. And feet on the floor for trust for the shorter people. If you have problem, then use the footrest. Your, remember, your office chair should be adjustable. Its height can be adjusted. Again, let's suppose if your height is 74 inch, then you should, your head should be about 20 inches to 28 inches away from the screen. Your sitting eye height should be about 51.5 inches. Give a tilt of 10 to 20 degree. Your sitting elbow height should be 28 inches and the seat height is 90. And at a standing height, eye height should be 69 and the standing elbow height should be 45.5. But remember this is just an example. Many people have different heights so you should adjust. Keep this thing that your arms and el your elbows and knees they should be at a 90 degree angle and your back must be supported. Now let's discuss about some of the techniques using which we can avoid the repetitive strain injuries. Use an ergonomic keyboard. See the picture. This is one of the pictures of an ergonomic keyboard developed by IBM. Traditional flat keyboard are not well suited to the shape of the human hands. An ergonomic keyboard allows you to hold your hands in a more natural position with the wrist straight rather than angled outward while typing. You should sit up straight. Avoid slouching as you type and keep your feet flat on the floor in front of you. Avoid crossing your legs in front of you or under your chair for long periods. Use a padded wrist support. If you type a lot, a wrist support should be helpful by allowing you to rest your hands comfortably when you are not actually typing. Remember, however, that you should never rest your wrists on anything, even a comfortable wrist support while you type. Use the support only when your fingers are not moving over the keyboard. Keep your arms straight. When typing, your hand should be in a straight line with your forearms when viewed either from the above or from the side. Keeping the wrist bent in either direction can cause muscle fatigue. Keyboard properly. You should learn to type. You will use the keyboard more efficiently and naturally if you know how to type. If you hunt and peek, you are more likely to slouch and keep your head down while looking at right the keyboard. This technique not only slows your down, but it also leads to fatigue and stiffness. Remember, Take frequent breaks. Get up and move around for a few minutes each hour and stretch occasionally throughout the day. And this is what I have been doing for the last 20 years. I never work continuously for more than 30 minutes. I take break for 5-10 minutes. After 30 minutes I just get up, move around, have a cup of tea or just walk around for some time, maybe 5 minutes break or so and then come back and then sit down and then start working again. <clears throat> now
Let me show you the method of keeping your wrist straight. <coughs> <coughs> The figure on the lower right corner shows that this position is wrong. This is the right way of typing. Do not bend your wrist. Keep it. Keep them straight. Keeping them straight is the right position. Like this, typing like this or typing like that is the wrong way and it will give you fatigue. This should be not straight like this or like this if you're tapping like that you're just hurting your muscles and it will cause a lot of problem now let discuss some other input devices in our last lecture we mainly focused on the two standard input devices which are keyboard and mouse but there are many other ways available nowadays that technology has developed so tremendously that now you can input data into the computer apart from these two traditional input devices. In this figure, I'm just showing you the concept. You can input through smartphones. You can input through digital cameras, through webcams, scanners, optical character recognitions, barcode readers, touch pens, stylus, mouse traditional keyboard the other traditional voice recognition game players joysticks etc now let us discuss some of the these alternate input devices although the keyboard and the mouse are the most used input devices there are many other ways to input data into a computer Alternative input devices are important parts of some special purpose computers. Tapping a handheld computer screen with a pen is a much faster way to input commands than typing on a miniature keyboard. On the other hand, a specialized device can give new purpose to a standard system. For example, if you want to play an action-packed game on your home PC, for example, you will have much more fun if you, you will use a joystick or a game controller than a standard keyboard or mouse. Nowadays, the 3D technology is also coming. We will now discuss several categories of alternate input devices and discuss the special uses of each. Apart from mouse, and there will be a joystick. You can also input with the light with the light pen, as in this case, the barcode readers, the tablets, the cameras, and the microphones. First of all, we will discuss the devices for the hand. Most input devices are designed to be used by hand. Unlike keyboard and mouse, many of these input devices are highly intuitive and easy to use without special skill. The first one we'll discuss is the pen. The pen-based systems including many tablet PCs, smartphones, personal digital assistants, in short PDAs, and other types of handheld computers use a pen for data input. Nowadays, the Samsung Galaxy Note it has a stylus. This pen is called a stylus. And with this, it is very easy to give input. This device is sometimes called a stylus. You hold the pen in your hand and write on a special pad or directly onto the screen. You can also use the pen as a pointing device, like a mouse, to select commands by tapping the screen. Pen-based system would be a handy way to enter text into the computer for word processing. In reality, developers have had a great deal of trouble perfecting the technology so that it can decipher people's handwriting with 100% reliability. Reliability is the major issue in the pen-based systems. Because hand 
writing recognition is so complex the pen based computers are not generally used for inputting large volume of data into the computer although they are used frequently for taking notes creating short messages and writing annotations on electronic documents the pen based computers are commonly used for data collection where the touch of a pen might place a check in a box to indicate a part that must be ordered or a surface that has been requested another common use is for inputting signatures or messages that are stored and transmitted as a graphic image such as a fax the touch screens they accept input by allowing the user to place a fingertip directly on the computer screen and usually it is used to make a selection from a menu of choices many of you must have used this technology on the atm machines in pakistan all the banks the, the atm banks are basically having the touch screens so you are familiar with using the touch screen the most touch screen computers they used sensors to detect the touch on the screen surface of a finger but other touch screen technologies are also in use as well these touch screens are well suited for simple applications such as atms or public information kiosks in the figure you can see a student is using a touch screen system to get information at a public information kiosk touch screens work well in environments where dirt or weather would render keyboards and pointing devices useless and where a simple intuitive interface is important touch screens have become common in fast food restaurants in departmental stores drug stores supermarkets where they are used for all kind of purposes from creating personalized greeting cards to selling lottery tickets one of the other input device which is very common and popular is the game controllers personal computers are widely used as gaming platforms challenging dedicated video game units like the sony playstation xbox and others because pcs they offer high graphic resolution than a standard television many gamers believe that a well equipped personal computer should provide a better gaming playing experience and even if you are if your computer is connected to internet you can play games with people around the world the game controllers provide custom input to the game and the modern controllers they offer feedback they have the vibration and if you made a mistake they will give you a little jerk a game controller can be considered as an input device because a computer game is a program much like a word processor a game accepts input from the user processes data and produces output in the form of graphics and sound as computer games becomes more detailed and elaborate more specialized game controllers are being developed to take advantage of their features the game controllers generally fall into two broad categories namely the joystick and the game pad let discuss these two one by one the joysticks they have been around for a long time and can be used with applications other than the games some joystick users actually prefer using a joystick rather than a mouse with some business applications even joysticks enable the user to fly or drive through a game directing a vehicle or a character and people they start moving in that direction like that they are very popular in the racing and flying games 
One variant of the joystick is the racing game controller, which includes an actual steering wheel. Some racing game controllers even include the foot pedals and gear shifts to make it as lively as possible and as close to the real world. A gamepad is a small flat device that usually provides two set of controls, one for each of the hand. And these devices are extremely flexible and are used to control many kinds of games. If you do not have a joystick, you can use a gamepad to control most racing and flying games. Many computer games still provide support for a mouse or keyboard. So a dedicated game controller is not always required. But believe me, in some of the games, it becomes cumbersome to use the keyboard and play with the keyboard. I've been playing games for many years. Nowadays, I'm not very competent in, in playing the games. But still, I find it sometimes it, I find it very difficult to play using the keyboard or even the mouse. Especially with the advent of PSP, Xbox 360, PlayStation, the, the theme of the playing game has been changed. But they are all connect, they can all be connected with the computer and you can download the games from the internet. And using the internet you can also play games across the world with other people so that's make it more lively and more efficient let's talk about the optical input devices for a long time futurists and computer scientists have had the goal of enabling the computer to see computers may never see in the same way the humans do but Optical technologies, they allow computers to use light as a source of input. The barcode readers, which you are seeing here, are one of the most widely used input device. The most common type of barcode reader is the flatbed model, which is commonly found in supermarkets and departmental stores. If you ever have visited the metro uh, supermarket in Islamabad or in Lahore or in Karachi, the, the flatbed was with the uh, uh, teller uh, person and either it sometimes they uh, move the things from there to read the barcode and if there is a difficulty over there, they use the handheld barcode reader. Basically, it converts the barcodes to number and the barcode uses the universal product code or the UPC. So this is the same sample of the barcode. These devices, they read barcodes which are pattern of printed bars that appear on the product packages. The barcode identifies the product. Basically, it the computer finds the numbers in the database and the technology that works in the uh, barcode readers is the light. The amount of reflected light indicates the number which is present. Let's discuss the barcode reading process. The barcode reader emits a beam of light. Frequently it is a laser beam. This beam is reflected by the barcode image. A light sensitive detector identifies the barcode image by recognizing special bars of the image at the both ends. It means that the image is recognized at the both ends. The light has to be there. The special bars are different. So the reader, basically the barcode reader, can tell whether the barcode has been read right side up or upside down. 
After the detector has identified the barcode, it converts the individual bar pattern into numeric digit code the computer can understand. Basically, it converts the light signals into the digital signals, means in the form of a zero or one. The barcode reader then feeds the data into the computer as though the number has been typed on a keyboard. And in this way, the computer understands the code and does the further processing. Like in the departmental store, using the barcode, they immediately detect its, uh, uh, the computer checks the database with the help of this barcode and it then tells the price, the quantity, the type and everything about a product. The other input device are, is the image scanners. Image scanners, or they are in, in short they are called scanners, they convert the printed media into basically any print uh, image scanners also called scanners they convert any printed image into electronic form by shining light onto the image and sensing the intensity of the light's reflection at every point basically it reflects light on the image the sensor reads the intensity of the light and the filter determines the color depth of the image. Well, for the sake of simplicity, the barcode reader which we have just discussed is a special type of image scanner. Let's see how an image is scanned. A light source is moved across a printed page. You have seen the flatbed scanners. You put the uh, paper or the image on the uh, flatbed scanner, you put the cover down, and when you switch it off, you see that a light goes across one time and it then comes back two times. The light bounces off the page and is passed through a lens. And then it goes onto the light sensitive diodes which converts lights into electricity. There are usually 300 to 600 diodes per inch. A circuit board converts the electricity to numbers and sends the information to the computer. I sincerely hope that you have understood the working of an image scanner. Color scanners, they use filters to separate the components of colors into the primary additive colors, red, green, and blue, at each point. The red, green, and blue, in short, they are called RGB. They are the primary additive colors. Why? Because they can be combined to create any other color. Processes that describe color in this manner are set to use RGB color. The traditional uh, flatbed uh, televisions, they use the RGB colors to show us all the images on the television. The image scanner is useful because it translates printed images into an electronic format that can be stored in the computer's memory. Then you can use the software to organize or manipulate the electronic image. Nowadays there are many image editing or even video editing softwares are easily available. Some are open source, some are free and some are commercial which can be purchased. For example, if you scan a photo, you can use a graphic program such as Adobe Photoshop to increase the contrast or adjust the color or turn the background color and you can even add mustaches, beard and many other things on the image. We have been seeing on the Facebook and all that that people are distorting the images and circulating it among the public. 
and this thing is ethically not true. Now let's discuss the optical character recognition. In short, we call it OCR. If you have scanned a text document, you might want to use optical character recognition software to translate the image into the text that you can edit. <coughs> so the OCR software they converts the scanned image into editable text. When a scanner first creates an image from a page, the image is stored in the computer's memory as a bitmap. A bitmap is a grid of dots and each dot is, re is represented by one or more bits. The job of the OCR software is to translate that array of dots into the text that the computer can interpret as letters and numbers. Let's see how OCR works. To translate bitmaps into text, the OCR software it looks at each character and tries to match the character with its own assumptions about how the letter should look. Because it is difficult to make a computer recognize an unlimited number of typefaces and fonts, the OCR software is extremely complex and not always 100% reliable. Despite the complexity of the task, the OCR software has become quite advanced. So the letters are, each letter is scanned, the letters are compared to the known letters, and the best match is entered into the document. It is very rare that it is 100% accurate. The chances of errors are there. Today, many programs can decipher a page of text received by a fax machine. In fact, computers with fax modems can use OCR softwares to convert faxes directly into text that can be edited with a word processor. There are two types of scanners which are most common. The one is the handheld scanner and other are the traditional flatbed scanners. The handheld scanners are more portable but typically require multiple passes to scan a single page because as they are not as wide as the uh, letter size paper like the flatbed scanner which you are visiting you are seeing here so you have to make them across the page many times so that the image can be built. The flatbed scanners they offer higher quality reproduction than do the handheld scanners. And they can scan a page in a single pass. Multiple scans are sometimes required for color images. To use a flatbed scanner, you place the printed image on the piece of glass similar to the way you place a, a page on the photocopier. Here in the diagram, this is the glass surface and you put the image or the paper inverted and put it on the glass. You just close the lid so that the light can, it cannot be distributed anywhere else and then you push the button. In some, in some medium size scanners, you feed the sheet to be scanned through the scanner similar to the way you feed a page through a fax machine. Now let's talk about some audio visual input devices. Today many new PCs are equipped with complete multimedia capabilities. New computers have features that enable them to record audio and video input and play it back. The microphones Let's see about the microphones. You can see different kind types of microphones around here and they can be connected to the computer. 
Now that the sound capabilities are standard in computers, microphones are becoming increasingly important as input device to record speech. Spoken input is often used in the multimedia, especially when the presentation can benefit from narration. And most personal computers, they now have phone dialing capabilities. So if you have a microphone and speakers or a headset micro microphone with an earphone, you can use your personal computers to make telephone calls. This experience I have been doing for the last many years using Skype. Some of you may have used the Skype to talk to your friends, relatives and the dear ones which are geographically separated and living at other ends of the world. But with Skype you just need a headset and you can contact them easily without any cost. You only need to have the internet connection. You can have Spike, uh, Skype, the software, with a very little software in your machine and the other person can also have the Skype at his end and you can just connect and have a lot of fun and chat with each other. The microphones, they also make the personal computers useful for audio and video conferencing over the internet. For this type of sound input, you need a microphone and a sound card. A sound card is a special device inside the computer which translates analog audio signals into digital codes the computer can store and process. And this process is called digitizing. Sound cards can also translate digital sig sounds back into analog signals that can be sent to the speakers. In the speech recognition, it basically understands the human speech. It allows you the dictation or the control of the computer. It basically in the back end it matches spoken sound to known phonemes and it enters the best match into the document. You simply using a very simple audio recording software that is built into your computer's operating system you can use a microphone to record your voice and create files on disk. The sound recorder available in the uh, Microsoft Windows is a very small software and you can record your sound and you can share it with your friends through email. You can embed these files in documents, you can use them in your web pages or you can email them to your friends and other people. The speech recognition. There is also a demand for translating spoken words into text, much as there is a demand for translating handwritten, handwriting into text. Translating voice to text is the capability known as speech recognition, or we can say voice recognition. With it, you can dictate to the computer instead of typing and you can control the computer with simple commands such as open or cancel. Speech recognition softwares that takes the smallest individual sound in a language called phonemes and translates them into text or commands. Although the English language use only about 40 phonemes, reliable translation is difficult. How it is difficult? For example, some words in English have the same sound but have different meanings. For example, TWO2 and TWO2, they both sound same. The challenge for the speech recognition software is to deduce a sound's meaning correctly from its context and to distinguish meaningful sounds from background noise. Speech recognition software have been used in commercial applications for years. But traditionally, it has been extremely costly 
as well as difficult to develop and use them. The low cost commercial versions of speech recognition software are also now available and they may promise to be a real benefit to user who cannot type or have difficulty using a keyboard. Newer generation speech recognition programs are much more reliable than the packages that were available few years ago. Some packages they can recognize accurately 80 to 90 percent of spoken words by using large stored vocabularies or the words that they can recognize. The user may need to train the software to recognize speech patterns or the pronunciation of some words. But this procedure is relatively simple. Another enhancement to speech recognition program is their ability to recognize continuous older system they require to pause between words which improved accuracy but greatly slowed down the data entry process. The speech recognition programs they usually require the use of a noise cancelling microphones. The noise cancelling microphone is a one that filters out the background sound like the background noise, the distortion that has to be reduced so that the software can understand the, the word. Most commercial so packages, they come with a microphone. Let's discuss some other type of audio input. Computers can accept many kinds of audio input. If your computer has a sound card with appropriate plugs, you may be able to input music from a compact disc player, from a tape player, even from a radio, or from a record player. I think many of you are not believing that this can be possible, but if you have the appropriate interface cable, you can do this. If the audio source output sounds in the form of analog, the sound card must convert the analog signals into digital signals so that the computer can store and use it. Remember, computer can only understand the binary language, which is the language of zero or one. But this thing is not true necessary when recording from a compact disc or a DVD. But conversion is required for analog sources such as phonograph, records, cassette tapes, and etc. MIDI, Musical Instrument Digital Interface. If your sound card has a built-in MIDI port, or if you have a dedicated MIDI port, you can connect many kind of electronic musical instruments with your computer. The MIDI based instruments can communicate with and they can control one another. And any PC can be used to control the MIDI instruments and to record their output. As you can see in the figure, the piano is attached with the computer and the person is playing music or recording music on it. MIDI is extremely popular among musicians of all stripes who used it to write, record and edit music and even to control instruments and effects during the performances. Keyboards, drum machines, sequencers and other types of electronic instruments can be connected together and to a computer. How? By using the MIDI technologies. MIDI can be used for digital recording or the playback of music and musicians they can produce professional results using the MIDI. The video input. With the growth of multimedia and internet, computer users are adding video input capabilities to their systems in great numbers. Applications such as video conferencing, they enable the people to use full motion video images which are captured by the video cameras and they transmit them to a limited number of recipients on the network 
or to the world on the internet. Videos are commonly used in presentations and web pages where the viewer can start, stop and control various parts of the playback. The video camera and the webcam. The video camera used with computers digitize the images by breaking them into individual pixels. A pixel is one or more dots that express a portion of an image. Each pixel's color and other characteristic are stored as digital code. This code is then compressed because video images can be very large so that it can be stored on the disk or transmitted over a network. A popular or an inexpensive type of PC video camera called a webcam as you can see in a figure they can sit on top of a PC monitor or be placed on a stand so that the user can capture images of himself or herself while working at the computer. And this arrangement is handy for video conferencing where multiple users see and talk to each other in real time over a network or internet connection. Using a PC video camera or webcam system, you can conduct online video conferences and can include full motion video in your documents or email messages. PC video cameras, they enable you to conduct video phone calls. Many personal computers, they feature built-in software that transforms a conventional telephone call into a two-way video phone call. But for this purpose, you have to use a video capture card. The user can also connect other video devices such as VCRs, camcorders with the personal computer. Affordable video capture cards enable the home users to edit their videotapes like professionals. The digital cameras work much like PC video cameras except that the digital cameras are portable handheld devices that capture still images. Whereas the normal film cameras they capture image on a specially coated film, the digital cameras captures the images electronically. The digital camera can digitize the image, they can compress it and they can store it on a special memory card. The user can then copy the information to a personal computer where the image can be edited, copied, printed, embedded in a document or transmitted to another user. The most digital cameras they can store dozens of high resolution images at a time and most cameras accept additional memory that increase their capacity even further. Moving digital images from a digital camera to a computer is a very simple process that uses standard cables, disks or even infrared networking capability. Nowadays the multimedia card readers are available. You just put the card in the card reader, connect it to, with a USB port, connect it to the computer and then you can transfer the images very easily. Almost most digital cameras, they look like traditional fil film cameras, but they work in a very different way. The digital cameras have become standard equipment for designers of all kind. In the field of web page design, digital cameras enable designers to shoot a subject and quickly load the image on their computer. This process saves the steps of acquiring existing photographs or developing and printing film-based photos which must be scanned into the computer. The designers, they can update a website's illustrations very quickly and regularly using digital cameras. The graphic designers, they can edit and enhance digital photographs in innumerable ways using the photo editing software. Adobe Photoshop is a very popular photo editing software. For example, a landscape designer can use a digital camera to take a picture of a house and then use landscape design software to modify the image to show how the house might appear with different landscaping. That's the end of our lectures. Let's discuss the summary what we have discussed in our today's lecture number five. We started with the ergonomics and input devices. Ergonomics is the study of the way how we use the computers. We discuss the repetitive stress injuries, RSI. We discuss about the carpal tunnel syndrome, how the muscles can be uh, inflamed and cause problems. 
we also discussed the techniques how to avoid the keyboard related injuries then we discussed how to sit at a computer keeping your back straight your elbows should be at a 90 degree your key knees should be at 90 degrees and we also learned about the techniques to avoid repetitive stress injuries we also discussed the alternate input devices and in that context we discussed devices for the hand such as pen and touch screens with the pen based system the computers are handy for writing notes or selecting options from the menus but they are not well suited for inputting long text documents touch screens system they accept input directly through the uh, through the monitor and touch screen systems are useful for selecting text and menus but they are not useful for inputting text or other types of data in large quantities the game controller is a special input device that accepts the user input for playing a game the two primary types of game controllers are joysticks and the game pads we discussed the optical input devices such as the barcode readers which are used in grocery stores they can read barcodes translate them into numbers and input the numbers into a computer system we discussed about the image scanners that convert printed images into digitized formats that can be stored and manipulated in the computers an image scanner required equipped with the OCR software can translate a page of text into a number of character codes in the computer's memory for the audio input devices we discuss about the microphones they can accept auditory input using speech recognition software you can use your microphone as an input device for dictating text navigating programs and choosing commands to use a microphone or other audio devices for input you must install a sound card in your computer a sound card takes analog sound signals and digitizes them a sound card also converts the digital sound signals to back to the analog form and in the end the last thing we discussed was the video input devices the pc video cameras and digital cameras they can digitize full motion video and still images which can be stored and edited on the personal computer or they can be transmitted over a local area network or the internet that is all for the today's lecture i hope the things which we have discussed today will be clear to you in the end these are the two recommended websites where you can have a detailed discussion on the repetitive strain injuries and the carpal tunnel syndrome apart from these website i will strongly recommend to visit more websites through google through yahoo or through ping allah hafiz